Hi, everyone, and welcome to my show called We Were Lied To About 9-11. I am your host, John Gold, and this show is part of the Soapbox People's Network. Today's show is going to focus on the topic of disinformation, misinformation, the infiltration of movements, among a number of other issues. There is even a little debate on how important the topic of 9-11 is in the scheme of things in today's world. Okay, this is John, and I'm here with John Albanese. How are you doing tonight, John? I'm fine. How are you doing? I'm doing as best as I can. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and read your bio. Um, John Albanese, an independent filmmaker and writer from New York City, um, was one of the original members of New York 9-11 Truth. John's film, Everybody's Gotta Learn Sometime, received national attention when it premiered at the Tribeca Screening Room during the Tribeca Film Festival in 2006. Okay, that's the end of your bio. Um, before we begin, I want to make sure that people know that this is a very difficult topic to cover. Um, we are risking making people angry. And unfortunately, it simply can't be avoided. Some people have hated me for years, so it will be nothing new for me. Um, it's just a burden I've had to bear. However, we believe this is an important topic that needs to be discussed and addressed, and hopefully people will learn something from our discussion. That's what this show is all about. All right, so John, you ready for your first question? Sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. Make, make it sound make it sound pretty ominous. Um, <laughs> go ahead. Um, what was the day of nine eleven like for you? Well, it, it, it was it was a pretty rough day. Um, you know, I, I live in New York City, and my wife and I were both working in Manhattan when it happened. Um, so we we witnessed it. Um, and you know, I actually rushed uh, downtown to get my wife. Uh, so we were, you know, we weren't in, in the financial district, but you know, she was a lot closer to the scene than than I was. I was working uptown. Um, so you know, as, as people from New York know, you could see the World Trade Center uh, from almost anywhere in New York. And uh, we were down around Union Square, and uh, you know, we saw the buildings collapse, and we saw people's reactions. I, I think it was people's reactions that impacted us the most. Uh, people were just, uh, you know, hysterical, crying in the streets, walking around, not knowing what to do. Um, so it was pretty impactful uh, to our lives. Both of us, um, you know, had uh, post-traumatic stress, you know, for, for a long time afterwards from what we had witnessed that day. Um, you had told me, or I had heard you talk about how people were meeting at churches. Uh, after 9-11 to comfort themselves. Did you go to those churches? Uh, well, that, that's where I actually came uh, came across uh, New York 9-11 Truth at that time. Okay. It was a, a meeting at the, the Unitarian Church uh, in Manhattan. And, uh, you know, when, when I, you know, I was active, actively seeking it. I, I started to have questions, uh, you know, pretty early on about the event. Uh, well, my well Go ahead. I guess my way of dealing with uh, the emotional fallout was to uh, study it. You know, was to go online and and you know look look at what had happened and read everything I could on the subject because it was uh, it was my way of of dealing with the uh, the emotions. And uh, you know, I did come across this group in New York. Um, and the questions that they were raising. So I, I did seek them out. So I went to the Unitarian Church, and at that time, up on the stage was uh, Kyle Hentz, who uh, later went on to make the film Press for the Truth, one of the better you know, treatments on the subject. Uh, Les Jameson, who went on to actually gain control of New York 9-11 Truth eventually. Um, uh, Nicholas Lavis, who was also one of the founding members of New York 9-11 Truth and uh, was very active with writing on the subject, is still an activist, I think, to this day on, on other issues. Uh, and Nico Haupt was up on the stage. <laughs> All right. Um, it, just 
to clarify, it was Nick Levis that coined the phrase 9-11 truth, was it not? Um, I've, I've heard him say that, and I, and I believe him because I, I know that these were the earliest days of, uh, you know, the questioning that started to happen. Um, so, you know, it would not surprise me at all that he had coined the phrase. Um, what was the first thing you questioned about 9-11? Well, uh, of course, the, you know, the question I had was how, uh, you know, how could this have happened in this day and age with the technology that we have and the intelligence apparatus we have, how, how could it have happened? Uh, and, of course, I think the question everyone was asking, which is what did they know and when did they know it? And the thing that struck me as the most peculiar was that, uh, you know, within 24 hours, uh, they had pictures of all the hijackers on TV. They knew their names. They had photographs of all of them, and they basically, you know, declared these are the people who did it. And that, is that kind true? Of struck... I'm sorry. Is that true that they did have their photographs within 24 hours? I know they had their names within 24 hours. As far as photographs, are you absolutely sure? I'm, I'm not was... absolutely sure, but I, I will tell you, if you're asking me what is one of the things that struck me as, um, you know, questioning the event, uh, it was the, the quickness with which we declared who had done it uh, and the photographs being on TV. Now, was it 24 hours? Was it 48 hours, uh, 72 hours? I'm, I'm not exactly sure. I don't think it makes much of a difference. Uh, it, well, but I thought I, I had read once from a debunker site that it was two weeks for them to post no, pictures. But I no, no, it was okay. not two weeks. Uh, it, it was within days of the event. Um, that I, I would be willing to stake my reputation on. Uh, well, it, one of the things that Kristen Bratweiser asked at a at a meeting, not eleven family member, Kristen Bratweiser. She asked, and I, I don't remember. I wish I had the quote the quote in front of me. Uh, she was at a meeting with the families and the FBI, and she asked them, basically, how how were you able to swoop in within hours to to a, the flight schools that these uh, some of these hijackers trained at? And the FBI told her that we got lucky. So, you know, to give an indication that you know these people must have been on the radar prior to 9-11. Well, we, we now know from the information that, that's out there that, that, you know, they were being watched and they were being tracked, and um, that's not, you know, that's that's no longer a mystery. Um, right. But, you know, there, there were other claims, like they found the passport of one of the hijackers in the rubble of the World Trade Center. Um, now, I don't know if that's true or not. I, You know, again, I, I don't want to speculate. But if you're asking me what are the things that triggered my thinking on the subject, these were the things that triggered my thinking. I don't know actually to this day what they mean, but it seems very strange to me that given the volume of destruction at, at the World Trade Center, the, just the, the, the amount of space and the amount of rubble that was in, um, you know, in that area burning, actively burning and, and uh, being worked on by the first responders and the fire crews uh, to, to have found the paper passport of one of the hijackers struck me as, it seems suspicious. It, it, it could just be one of those things. Oh, you, you know, astronomical odds may have just have occurred on that day, magically occurred on that day, but it was one of the things that did strike me as it, it, it got my interest, you know, up enough that I started to go online and I started to actively seek some of the answers to some of the questions that I had. And I started to see that there was uh, the beginnings of um, a movement nationwide of people who were pointing at various things that seemed off or seemed inaccurate or seemed suspicious. Um, and, you know, that, that's really how it all started for me. Um, <clears throat> have you ever had an experience where you believed what someone was saying and promoted that information only to find out that that information was wrong? Um, I, I would say the majority of the time. 
The majority of the time? The major, majority of the time, yeah. I, you know, once the years started to pass and this uh, this became a phenomenon, 9-11 Truth started to actually gain some traction and became a, a nationwide uh, phenomenon. Uh, you know, when I started looking at the things that people were promoting, um, I would say there was more garbage out there than there was actual factual well-researched, vetted information. Um, and that was, you know, that was, of course, the, the central problem with, with this whole issue. So because you're saying you know, that you have, you, you have promoted bad information in the past, is what you're saying? Myself? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, actually, I think that I did get caught up in a couple of... Uh, you know, it was kind of like a vacuum cleaner sucking up everything that was available, all of the research that was available, and, and, and throwing it out there uh, as part of the strategy of just getting these questions recognized and getting the public's attention. And in retrospect, uh, I regret a lot of the information that I well, believed at the there, time. Or, uh, was, you know, I was told by people that I trusted that you know, this was legitimate information. And you know, of course, hindsight's always twenty twenty. And in the perspective of time now, I look back and the, the, you know, not everything that I uh, included in the, in the information that I was sharing was, was accurate. Well, the reason that I ask, and did you lose credibility amongst the people you were telling this information to? Oh, that's a tough question because it, it was such a, an odd assortment of characters. Um, you know, it was a very colorful, let, let's, let's just put it that way, it was a very colorful movement, as you probably know. Um, you know, a lot of the people who were involved were um, central to the reason why the movement over time lost a lot of its credibility because they, you know, at, at least I can admit that I wasn't always right. Uh, there were a lot of people who were promoting information that, um, you know, were demonstrably wrong, and they were not able to even look at facts that would, uh, you know, demonstrate that what they're promoting is is demonstrably wrong. Uh, well, you know, some, something we had talked about offline was the, the something called the backfire effect which is a, you know, it's a phenomenon with people that, you know, who have very strongly held beliefs if you present facts to these people. Uh, what the research shows is that people will not become swayed to, uh, to believe what you're saying, but the, they'll actually become more entrenched. So the more, for exa example, the, the, the anti-vaccine community, uh, you can try presenting facts to them. You can show them the scientific research, you could show that uh, the person who, who started this whole thing with the autism claims uh, has been stripped of his medical license, his, uh, his uh, uh, research has been totally discredited and, and, and has been labeled as completely made up, and this will not change their mind. It will, in fact, harden their position. They'll find extraneous reasons to explain all of it away. They'll, they'll go out on a limb and say, well, it's all a conspiracy, and the doctors are all, you know, the pharmaceutical industry is withholding money from researchers, and, and they'll, they'll create a whole scenario where these facts can be dismissed, and that's the backfire effect. And, you know, we had backfiring going on in, in the 9-11 Truth Movement uh, to the point where the worst possible research became what was in the front. Well, because the reason that the I harder asked this we try to the harder we try to demonstrate to them the, the the foolishness of their ways, the more entrenched they became in their position, and the more they they doubled down on stupid. Well, and there the harder there was a the reason that I asked this question is I wanted to tell my own experience with promoting bad information um, is to show that neither of us are perfect in any way, shape, or form. Um, but I, I think, you know, one of the differences is that, you, you know, we'll admit that we're wrong when we're shown to be wrong on something and we learn from our mistakes and we, we try not to repeat them, but neither of us are perfect 
and I, and I just wanted to make that point. Um, one in one instance where I can remember, uh, two actually, where I had heard some information and I heard, thought it was credible because people told me that the person promoting it was credible. Um, I think the name was Carl Schwartz, and at the time he was he was saying yeah. that he had footage of of a plane that was different than what we were told hit the towers. And I, you know, I, everybody at work, I was telling about this. This is, you know, a long time ago. And when, when nothing came out, when he had absolutely nothing, you know, to, to show that commercial airliners didn't strike the towers, I lost a lot of credibility among my coworkers because of it. They started calling me, a conspiracy theorist. So that, I think that was my first time where I had that kind of experience. And, and another time that I can remember, um, someone by the name of Stanley Hilton. Do you remember him? Um, well, uh, that name, no. the first name you mentioned, I, I do remember him. You know, I knew him personally, but the second name, no. Okay, Stanley Hilton, I think... I think he was portrayed as the chief of staff for Bob Dole at one time. He was a lawyer. I think he was representing, um, so I think, 400 family members at one time who were trying to file a lawsuit, and it, it fell through and stuff like that. I think at one time, Stanley Hilton said that he had actual documentation to show that the Bush administration was responsible for the 9-11 attacks. And I thought, well, you know, Stanley Hilton, Jesus, he was the chief of staff of Bob Dole. This is somebody who's credible, my God. You know, and again, I, I think I promoted that information and nothing ever came of it. No documentation was ever presented to anybody, you know, um, that he was describing. And, and it was just, I, I learned a lot of lessons over the years about uh, promoting information, promoting bad information, and it came to bite me in the ass. Um, you know, my, my very first interview was with Opie and Anthony, who were rivals of Howard Stern. And I was horrible during that interview. If you go back and listen to it, I mean, I... I didn't have talking points written out like I would today. Um, it, it was just, you know, we're not perfect. I've made many mistakes, and I, I just want people to know that. Um, neither of us are. So as we move on, um, what part has the corporate media played with regards to spreading disinformation? Uh, as it pertains to 9-11 or as it pertains to uh, life itself? Uh, well, 9-11, I, 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 I would love the examples of, of 9-11, if you could, but anything. Well, I, I, think, I, I, I think that since 9-11, um, and maybe not necessarily as a direct result of 9-11, but since 9-11, um, I think that, you know, we've seen the technology uh taking us to a place that um, is very different from anything that we've seen before. Uh, the advent of social media like Facebook and Twitter and uh, all of that technology plus the proliferation uh, of, of smartphones and the Internet itself uh, has created a phenomenon where I believe people can be manipulated in such a way that we've never seen before. You know, when we talk about COINTELPRO, um, you know, the techniques that they used for COINTELPRO uh, compared to today, uh, you know, th there's such a difference in, in that the, the proliferation of disinformation that's out there now, uh, they, they found a way to actually get the public to do the dirty work for them in that all they need to do is seed the internet and the, you know, the, the social media with these ideas and there's, it seems like there's an endless supply of useless
useful idiots out there who are willing to pick up this information and run with it. And so they're getting free labor from the American public. Uh, and really, they have to do very little but sit back and watch it unfold. Uh, I, I, I think the term is astroturfing. Uh, it, it, it gives the illusion of a grassroots movement where people pick up on certain ideas and they organize around it, but AstroTurf is, is not real grassroots. It's really being engineered by corporate interests or political interests or organized religions or even, maybe even foreign interests. At this point, it's, it's become very hard to tell where our facts come from. Well, with regards to the corporate media and, you know, the individuals you spoke of who were more than willing to promote certain information, those are the individuals that the corporate media focuses on in order to paint the whole in a certain light. Um, but with regards to the corporate media, there was a time when you could openly question 9-11 and, and be cheered for it. I mean, if you watch the third-party debates between David Cobb and Michael Bednarik from 2004, which is available on my YouTube channel, which is Gold9472, they openly questioned 9-11. And the reason they were okay with doing so was because the media didn't have the chance yet to have its attack campaign, making anyone who questions 9-11 you know, the equivalent of a baby killer or a dog torturer. Um, <clears throat> you know, they have, with regards to the 9-11 truth movement and disinformation from the corporate media, they've jumped on murderers who just happened to post something about 9-11 uh, on the Internet and saying, you know, they're 9-11 truthers, the 9-11 truthers are murderers, um, you know, they're all, they're all dangerous. And, you know, I saw that happen a number of times. There was a guy uh, called the Pentagon shooter who took a couple of shots at the Pentagon. And he, maybe it, I guess he said something about 9-11 online. And at the Treason in America conference in 2010, ABC News came to the event in an attempt to paint... Um, everyone there is dangerous. And it was at the time of the Pentagon shooter. And RT, Russia Today, also showed up to do um, co news coverage of the event. But they were there to do real news, you know, to talk about what exactly was going on at the conference. The ABC News had an agenda. And there was actually a paper in Philadelphia that wrote an interesting article showing the contrast between the two uh, media outlets. So, um, you know, there was the Pentagon shooter, there was the guy who went into the Holocaust Museum and, and shot and murdered someone, and I think Glenn Beck said that he was a hero of the 9-11 truth movement. Right. Um, you know, <laughs> there's so many instances of that. That is disinformation from the corporate media. If you think that somebody who questions 9-11 is a murderer or unpatriotic, then I think that you, you've been watching a little bit too much television, <laughs> unfortunately. Well, you know, it, it shouldn't surprise anyone that, you know, the, the media, um, you know, produces propaganda. Uh, <laughs> you know, especially at, during a time of war, the nation was attacked and... Uh, the country was uh, mobilizing for war, and you know the, the country had very little patience and very little tolerance for any sort of dissension in this country of any form. Uh, you, you know, it, they, they basically crucified anyone who even questioned the marching orders of, of that administration. And, you know, we still see it reverberating to this day with the re revelation that, you know, the CIA was engaging in, uh, you know, illegal activity and torturing people. And uh, the very reasons we went to our, our Iraq, you know, the weapons of mass destruction, there was some voices that were ringing the alarm bells 
leading up to the invasion of Iraq saying, wait a minute, you know, these aluminum tubes, they're not being used for nuclear centrifuges. Uh, but it was a time when there was, there was very little tolerance for any voices that strayed from the singular determination that this nation was going to go to war. We had been attacked, and we needed to just unify behind a singular voice. And what well, we see, we see how that worked out for us. Uh, well, but that's when I blame, when I look at the the failure of 9/11 Truth as a movement, I put that failure squarely on the shoulders of the members of 9-11 Truth itself, the media, sure. It should surprise no one that they produced propaganda uh, trying to demonize us in the eyes of the public. But no one demonized us more than ourselves by putting out garbage, crazy conspiracy theories. This was never meant to be a conspiracy theory movement. It started as an accountability movement. People asking, how did this happen? Who's responsible? Who Who is going to pay for these mistakes? Right. Well, very early on. What lapses, and why are the facts that we're being given not adding up? Why are there so many discrepancies in the official account? Why are so many pages of the congressional report redacted and blacked out? And, you know, what was the sorty relationship to all of this? You know, that that's how it began. But well, it fell into the same bucket that we're now in right now, where we we live in a highly paranoid society now, where everything is a hoax, everything is a conspiracy, every mass shooting, every high-profile crime, every natural event is the product of some conspiracy that Obama is behind, or the you know the anti-gun lobby is behind, and the word truther has become the actual opposite of its literal meaning, which is, and, 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 and it is true. I mean, if you look at what the truthers out there are promoting nowadays uh, with high-profile crimes like Aurora and Sandy Hook and uh, Virginia State and even Ferguson, I, you know, my understanding is that Alex Jones is uh, promoting the idea that the Ferguson shooting was a hoax and that you know Obama was behind it. People well, reach their saturation level with this nonsense because the internet enables the worst among us to have the loudest voices. Well, let me let me say something. You know, very early on, the 9/11 Truth Movement. You know, you, you said this was about supporting the families seeking a 9/11 commission. And then once that report was released, it was about, you know, getting their unanswered questions answered, among other things. It was about uh, asking good questions and demanding answers. Uh, basically, it was about supporting the family members, seeking truth, accountability, and justice. And somewhere along the way, the movement lost its way. And I, and I want to talk about what you just mentioned. I think... One of the reasons that, you know, there are people out there who say that everything is a conspiracy theory is because of something that I call the conspiracy theory industry. And you mentioned someone, you know, Alex Jones, who is somebody, I think, in the conspiracy theory industry. He's a businessman. And he is notorious for saying that everything that happens is a false flag attack or some kind of conspiracy. And, and people, unfortunately, people pick up on that. And that, that's something else I want to address. You know, what's the difference between disinformation and misinformation? Because, you know, there's disinformation, which I think is information that is bad, that is purposefully put out there for whatever reason. And misinformation is when somebody, you know, a good, a good-minded person, somebody good-hearted, trying to make a difference, picks up this information, this bad information, and promotes it, thinking that it's good. That's misinformation. And I actually, you know, be, as we spoke earlier, I have some pity for for people that do that. Um, 
and I, and I, I do my best to try and talk to, to people like that. Um, not confrontationally. I mean, you know, you talked about how we are our, we were our own worst enemy, the 9-11 truth movement, and all of the infighting that took place, um, and a lot of it having to do with the, these theories that people were putting forward. And, you know, we were trying our very best, very, very best to remain as credible as possible. Who's you know, we? Very, oh, I, you know, I, I, I certainly, you know, I, I always felt that you had integrity in what you did. And there were a select few who had integrity and were approaching it in a way that uh, I can respect. But I would say the vast majority of it uh, was, you know, I, 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 could, I could remember being angry with the media for referring to us as conspiracy theorists. But now in, in the context of time, uh, it, it, they were right. Uh, it was conspiracy theorizing. It was all what? speculation. What if the planes were remote controlled? What if there's a you know a plane? What if it was a flyover of the Pentagon as opposed to an actual strike? What if it was a missile? What if it was this? What if it was that? And that's what most people were clinging to. And I never saw a, a, a really solidified movement. You know, we keep using the term movement. I I, I see that there was some right wing. Uh, leanings coming out of the Alex Jones camp and the loose change camp and the libertarian movement and uh, that were taking it in the direction that, yeah, it was the conspiracy. It was a conspiracy theory movement. And that's where it essentially went wrong. And it, I, I think it remains an extremely dangerous situation that we live well, in I wanna... currently because people do not seem to be able to differentiate between facts and fiction. And people now are enabled, that's the key word here, people are enabled to shop for the truth that they're comfortable with. You don't like Jews? That's fine. You could go on Google and you will find a lot of support out there on certain websites that will tell you the Holocaust didn't happen and they will seem, they will appear very scholarly, and well-researched and very convincing if you already have this precondition. Well, I, I generally people. tell people, I generally tell people, you know, don't just listen to what the 9-11 Truth Movement is saying. Go look at what the bunkers are saying. Go look at what other people are saying. And, you know, I often say to people to go to the source as often as you can. If, you, if there's a report about something, about 9-11, and there's a name mentioned in the article, maybe you can get in touch with the individual who's mentioned and get, you know, their story. Um, the, I don't have, you know, there's the story of uh, the Lieutenant General Mahmoud Ahmed from the Pakistani ISI wire transferring $100,000, uh, ordering Omar, Ahmed Omar Saeed Sheikh to wire transfer $100,000 to Mohammed Atta. And I took that story as far as humanly possible. I even tried to contact the uh, arresting officer in India who arrested Ahmed Omar Saeedji to try and talk to him about him. Um, you know, I, I followed his prison movements <laughs> to see which prisons he was being held in because he was being moved a lot. Um, and I, ju I just couldn't take it any further, unfortunately. Um, but, I mean, that's the level sometimes that if you can do that, if you have the time to do that kind of research, wonderful. But you have to be very careful um, with, with what you promote. You have to, because, you know, we, none of us, very few of us have letters after our names, like PhD or or whatever that, that bring us bring a sense of credibility with what we say. So when we approach people or when we talk to people, we have to use the best information possible. Stuff that really can't be debunked. Um, you have, in order to plant the seeds to to get people active for this issue, which is still today 
a very important issue. And one thing I want to talk about is human nature. When the government refuses to answer our questions, um, when those who should be able to answer our questions refuse to do so, it's human nature to speculate as to the reasons why. But you have to be able to differentiate between what is speculation and what are facts. Um, how, do, and, how do we? But but you know the problem, the brick wall that I've hit hit with this is that having observed 9/11 truth, what I found was that what was created there was a false dichotomy between junk science and then this other classification which may or may not be the truth. And this false dichotomy was, you know, it, it created an environment where people were so repulsed by the, the garbage um, theories that they ran into the arms of the only other alternative. They ran into the arms of the activists who were promoting something that seemed credible because they had a, a choice between the two. It's kind of like the way Fox News and MSNBC works, you know? People are repulsed by Fox News, so they run into the arms of CNN. Well, how do you know CNN is telling you the truth? You don't. But it seems more credible to our sensibilities when you compare it against the straw man of Fox News. And the problem that I have is, at this stage, how do we know anything is the truth? anymore how do we know any of the research that we've promoted that seems credible like this is the good stuff this is the stuff that we tell people well i'm not a professional journalist i'm not uh i, I certainly have no connections in politics or the military industrial complex or in pakistan how do i know that the information that i'm promoting wasn't seeded just for me to pick up and run with by some other entity, some foreign entity or some political entity, military. You're absolutely right. right. But, but unfortunately, if you don't, if you can't prove that, then you have to, to to say that okay, there might be some credibility to this particular story. Um, or you, you you know, for instance, that, that story, the the wire transfer story, it was the Times of India that reported it. And Agents Front's press also corroborated the story. Um, you look at, you know, the FBI apparently made statements saying that he was a, a paymaster, Ahmed Omar Saeed Sheikh, um, by CNN in late 2001. You have Indian investigators telling Robert Mueller in early 2002 about Saeed Sheikh's role. In 9-11, you have somebody who was tortured, unfortunately, and actually mentioned that Ahmed Omar Saeed Sheikh wire transferred $100,000 to Mahabhanata. When you look at all of this information, um, it, it starts to, you, you can see that, you know, there's more reason to think that it might be true than not. So, but you still can't, unfortunately, prove it. Um, right, and, 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 but, that, but that's also the hallmark of disinformation. You know, the, the hallmark of disinformation is planting not just one seed, but planting a row of seeds that cause people with cognitive dissonance and disenchantment with their lives and with society and the political system that is inherently dishonest and, and all the rest of it. And it, it, it causes them to connect the dots. It, it, you know, these seeds could be planted very cleverly to make it appear like a web of evidence. I mean, it, that was the crux of the play, 12 Angry Men. Okay, you had 12 people sitting in a room, and they had facts on the table. They had a lot of facts, and they all pointed in the same direction that this person was guilty of murder. One problem, he wasn't. And facts are a funny thing. You could have individual facts, even if the individual facts are correct you could assemble facts in such a way that it paints a picture that is just completely wrong. Oh, absolutely. You, you can do that. And when you add yeah. disinformation to the mix that is being crafted by people uh, who have political interests, foreign interests, uh, 
military agendas or whatever it might be, uh, it, it becomes almost impossible to sift through it and have, I mean, you, you may think that you have a handle on reality, but what I'm becoming increasingly convinced of is that we live in a bubble. We live in a, a, in a very tightly controlled uh, environment where people are enabled to shop for the facts that they want. Um, you know, the, the Tea Party oh. has their set of facts, and we have our set of facts. And I, I'm a little uncomfortable that we may just be the Tea Party of the right, of the left. No, I, you know what? I, there, are, there are two sides or three sides, however many sides, to, to the story. And what I've done over the years, is, if, as I said, is that I've looked at both, and when I... I see that one doesn't address certain issues or, you know, disregards things, just omits information. Um, I have to think, well, maybe that this side, this this point of view is probably correct as compared to that point of view. But, you know, one of the things that we, that there is absolutely no doubt of is the fact that we were lied to about 9-11. About a great I, I, many I, well, things. Well, I, I can I, I can expand on that though. We are lied to about everything. And no, I, I understand just, that. What, and what what if that's just um, the new policy uh, for controlling people and keeping this uh, plutocracy going and uh, keeping the ruling elite uh, in control and the National Security Agency and 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 all the rest of them? Maybe that's Maybe that's just policy. We, we, we don't get the full story on anything. The dialogue in this country is very carefully constructed and controlled. We're told what we can talk about. For some reason, we, the decision was made. We, we're going to talk about what this country did with, uh, with interrogations and enhanced interrogation techniques and torture. That's going to be allowed this week. And next week, we'll talk about Bill Cosby. Well, but actually, they they don't really talk. They they talked about the Senate report, but they don't talk about how you know that it still might be going on. You know, the, who who knows what JSOC is doing, and and you know the the force feeding in in Gitmo is considered to be torture by by the UN, I think, and so it's it's still going on. And they also they didn't cover some of the most heinous things that I heard with regards to torture. I mean, I heard Seymour Hersh talk about how kids, the kids, boys, were being sodomized uh, in front of their mothers and that there was this ungodly shrieking. And, you know, the, the, the Pentagon has these videos that, that how show do we know these that, things. But how, how do we know that? But is Seymour Hersh telling you the story that you want to hear? No, but you see, the thing about Seymour Hersh is, is you have to look at his history um, as far as getting things right. And a lot of times, Seymour Hersh has gotten it right. So when well, yeah, somebody yeah, like and, that... And, and that's another hallmark of disinformation is mixing lies with the truth. And, you know, Carl Bernstein did a whole story in, in the 70s. And, and, you know, keep in mind, that's 40 years ago regarding the influence of the Central Intelligence Agency in the media, the mainstream media, the major networks, the, uh, the major press releases of the time, print was king at that time, you know, print journalism was king, and the influence of the Central Intelligence Agency within the print media. And his, his findings was that, you know, it's it saturated with intelligence assets who mold and manipulate and control and influence the direction which the message that is given to the American public is pointed. And that was 40 years ago. No, but I, I, I hear what you're saying, Texas. but, you know, what's the alternative, that we listen to absolutely no one at all? I, well, this the, is the, you know the fact that to me dilemma, in the corporate media, doesn't mean, um, you know, it's a it's a dilemma, and you know, unless we face up to the reality of the dilemma that we're faced with, which is that we're living in an age of almost an airtight sort of uh, information 
uh, gag order uh, associated with our ability to penetrate, uh, you know, the inner workings of our own government and the policy makers and the policies that are being crafted. Uh, you know, that, that is the, the modern day dilemma. And, you know, we're in such flux at this point with so many people running in so many different directions that it seems so engineered, at least to my sensibilities. It isn't just the Tea Party that's astroturfed. I think there's astroturfing going on on the left, there's astroturfing going on in the center. It, everything that the American public believes that they're doing uh, it is being controlled and, and manipulated. And there are, well, there are some organic things that go on. I think the, 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 uh, the movement for, uh, against police brutality, I, I, think, I don't think that's engineered. I think that's an organic sort of movement. I think Occupy Wall Street started as an organic movement uh, because of the injustices, the social injustices inherent in our financial systems. Uh, well, let, me, let, me, any... let me stop you for a second about Occupy. It was funny to me watching um, how the media, how the corporate media dealt with Occupy. It was like watching a rerun of the 9-11 truth movement. First, they were ignoring them completely. And then when they couldn't ignore them anymore, they started to misrepresent them or misrepresent their message. What are these people about? They started to, to make their arguments for them. And, and then... I, I, you know, there were people holding up signs saying Zionists control Wall Street or something to that effect. So then the media jumped on those little, the few, very few people saying things like that, and then portrayed the Occupy movement as being anti-Semitic and stuff like. And it all happened within a, a two-month time frame, and it, it, it was just fascinating to me to watch. Yeah, they've got it down to a science. Right, and besides, I don't. I don't think there's any meaningful organizing that's allowed to take place in this country anymore. I, I, I well, don't think I can, you can tell organize you organize without without infiltration, without disruption, without smear campaigns. Again, the COINTEL programs in the 1960s were were child's play compared to the tools that they have available to them. Well, now. okay, let me let me read a quote that I got from my book. Um, for those who don't know, I, I wrote a book. It was called 9-11 Truther, the, the Fight for Peace, Justice, and Accountability. Cindy Sheehan wrote the foreword to it. Um, and I, I'm actually proud of that book. So anyway, this is a quote. Quote, I have absolutely no proof whatsoever that anyone is an agent. I will say that the United States government or elements within it have participated in a massive cover-up regarding 9-11, and it isn't inconceivable, at least not to me, that they would put people on the Internet, start crap, or post nonsense in an effort to discredit specific individuals of this or this cause in general. It's also not inconceivable, at least not to me, that organizations friendly to a particular politician or entity in the United States government would spend money to put people on the internet to start crap or post nonsense in an effort to discredit people or this cause. We often see pro-Republican and pro-Democrat posters from different organizations post on sites. It's not a stretch to think that some of those people might have the goal of starting trouble. And it's one thing I've learned over the years, it is not hard to start trouble on the internet. Um, you know, it, there are so many instigators out there, um, you know, and the language that so the 9-11 truth movement used, for instance, um, lie hop and my hop. For those who don't know, lie hop is let it happen on purpose and made it happen on purpose. And it was a division, essentially, within the 9-11 truth movement. You either believed they let it happen or they made it happen. And it was a false distinction. It's no different 
to me um, than the false left-right paradigm that is, you know, unfortunately engulfed in this this country. Um, and you know, the, the language that the people used, I don't know. It, it's just they, they would call you if you believed um, if you brought up something like something about the hijackers. Any information pertaining to the hijackers, you were called a lie hopper because obviously there were no hijackers, according to some people. Um, and so it was a great cause of division within the 9-11 truth movement. Another thing that took place is something called uh, snitch, snitch jacketing, um, which I think was a COINTELPRO tactic, is where if you disagree with someone, you call them a shill or you call them an agent in order to build this uh, persona for this individual to make them, you know, this individual be almost like an agent to, to some people. Um, so they don't trust them. You know, I a lot of the problems of the 9-11 truth, you know, there were people who came on 911blogger.com and they, they were promoting Holocaust denial, you know, or whatever you want to call it. Holocaust revisionism, Holocaust denial, whatever. The Holocaust happened, <laughs> okay? There's so much evidence to show that it happened. It, it, it's a ridiculous thing. I don't even understand why you would try to say that, you know, this didn't happen. I understand people in the Middle East perhaps trying to say that it didn't happen because, uh, of what happened with Israel, you know, the, the becoming a Jewish state and and so forth. Um, but I don't understand why people would want to argue that the Holocaust didn't happen. But anyway, they showed up on 9-11 Blogger and trying to convince people that, you know, no, we were lied to about 9-11 or that elements within our government have earned the title of suspect for the crime of 9-11, that's hard enough on it all by itself. We don't need other crap, you know, being brought into into the fold. And you know, as the conspiracy theory industry, it's not just people like Alex Jones who have a radio station. It's people who come and table at different events who bring videos about all kinds of things, like chemtrails and you know the Illuminati and the reptiles who control everything and, and stuff like that. That's how it got introduced into the, the movement. And, you know, event, it, it wasn't just 9-11 anymore. We started to hear about all of these other kinds of things. Um, you know, and... Well, well, what, what has happened is, uh, you know, essentially there's a toxic environment now that revolves around any sort of uh, independent efforts to look for accountability on, on any level. We, we can't even agree that climate change is happening, okay? And we have these, these things called thermometers, you know? And we can't even agree that the temperatures are rising. And we don't even listen to our own scientists that this government funds, NASA, who are telling us exactly what they think is happening, we won't even listen to our own funded scientists. We're at a stage in, in this country where, where it's all bread and circuses, where it, it's all diversions, it's all, uh, it's all a, a clown act at this point. And where I once <laughs> believed that the internet was the salvation of grassroots political movements. Like, wow, now we could really organize. We could reach people all across the nation, and we could have an honest dialogue, and we could organize what we failed to take into consideration, that it is the most powerful tool that any government could ever hope to have over influencing the mindset of the public and gathering information on us. I mean, what if someone told you 15 years ago uh, the government wants you to go to the post office and register all of your political beliefs. We'll give you an index card. You need to list everybody that you've ever been affiliated with. 
We want to know what all your political beliefs are. We, we want to know what, you know, everything about you politically. You, you'd say, go fuck yourself. Yeah, I'm not going to go register this shit. People do it now willingly. They sign on to Facebook. They sign on to Twitter. They aggregate their friends online so that everyone can see, and they espouse their opinions publicly. The government has a tremendous amount of power over the psyche of the American public now, because not only do they have a captive audience in this virtual space, they can influence it. They can enter into the space themselves. They can seed it with disinformation. They can create disruptions in areas where they don't want to see organizing take place, and they could create organizing in places where it shouldn't be taking place, like the Tea Party. For whatever well, the Tea Party was actually hijacked. The Tea Party was hijacked. You know, the original Tea Party in the United States of America was a 9-11 truth effort that took place on December 16, 2006, where people across the country threw their, their copies of the 9-11 report into, you know, the closest water source, um, you know, and they retrieved them. Some of, Most people retrieved them so as to not pollute the water. But the following year, we were planning on doing it again, and then it was announced that there was this money bomb uh, for Ron Paul to run for president. Um, and so the people who wanted to pr promote the, the money bomb, um, th they took essentially they, – they took the Tea Party theme and, and made it into a, a Ron Paul run for president. Um, I don't know if you remember that. Sure, of course I do. You do remember. I don't know that okay, I, good. Well, I do. I, I don't know that I uh, – it's a little bit of a stretch to say that you know, it was a 9-11 truth movement that got hijacked and, and turned into the Tea Party, you know. Uh, but, um, you know, the seeds were there, you know, the, you know that, that strain of uh, activism was there. Uh, but well, again, well, you know, does anyone doubt that corporate interests are deeply entrenched in a lot of the individual organizing that you see taking place. You know, it's with that book, you know, what, what's the title of that book? What's, what's wrong with Kansas? I mean, people, it's gotten to the point where people are actually voting and organizing against their own interests. We're talking about existential threats to our survival. We're talking about the environment is clearly turning against us. And we've got, you know, even the Pentagon is, is treating it as an existential threat. And, you know, people are so malleable in their thinking. And the media has become so all-encompassing that we're essentially living in, in a bubble, uh, not unlike what the Germans were experiencing in the 1930s, you know, a, a completely airtight propaganda machine that controls what we see, what we think, what allowable dialogue exists. And the one tool that we thought we had for organizing, the Internet and social media, is actually our worst enemy and is creating a, a toxic environment that's very, very dangerous to this country. And well, birth I don't know that, that I would... I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, go, go ahead. I, I, I just, I don't know... See... I, I, I realize that posting 9-11 information on Facebook is not the best way to reach people. I, you know, I have so many things to say. I would love it if a million people could hear what I have to say, but unfortunately, I don't know how to do that. I, I, I don't. I've but, tried but for the years. N but, the N but the NSA does know how to do it. Well, you, you get but, the imbalance here. You, you get the imbalance. You know, none of us have the ability to produce the volume of information that organized political groups can produce to influence the American public's perspective. I mean, there was a time in this country where it was okay to question the Kennedy assassination. We actually had a congressional uh, investigation that found that it was the result of a probable conspiracy. <laughs> You know, now, I, just had Phil, I just had Phil Sheenan on who wrote a book about 
the Warren Commission, and he says that, you know, there were studies done after that congressional inquiry that shows that they were wrong, and but he does think that the Warren Commission was corrupt, just like the 9-11 Commission, and, and so on and so forth. Um, now, with let's let's try to talk about the 9/11 truth movement a little bit more. Um, what are some of the theories that were put forward over the years? Well, first off, actually, let me talk about you know, as I said earlier, it seemed that the theme of the 9-11 truth movement was to support the family members seeking truth, accountability, and justice. And there were so many times that the, the 9-11 or the September 11th advocates would release a press statement calling into question this or that, and the corporate media completely ignored it. These are the people who would get so much media attention uh, prior to the release of the 9-11 report, and then after the, the 9-11 report was released and the narrative was set in stone, the, the Jersey Girls or the, the September 11th advocates became persona non grata. And there were times it seemed like I was like the only one promoting the different statements that put forward by them. Um, you know, when Lori Van Auken and Mindy Kleinberg wrote their report showing how poorly the 9-11 Commission answered their questions, I felt like I was the only one promoting it. I actually took some flack for promoting that report because it, quote, didn't go far enough. Um, and, you know, that's a, a lot of the... It seems that the theories became more important than getting accountability. Do you know what I mean? Like everybody was so concerned about their theory being correct. Right. Can you can you name some of the theories that were put out over the years that, you know, really were a detriment? Well, the theory that Israel was behind the attacks, I think that was uh you know, it served two purposes. Uh, first of all, it was not true, and second of all, it it, it created the uh, the perspective that uh, the nine eleven truth movement, at its heart, was anti Semitic. And uh, I think the Wiesenthal uh, Institute, uh, if that's the correct name, um, actually put out something naming nine eleven truth as uh, a, an organized hate group, as anti Semitic at its base. And, uh, you know, they really basically lumped us all in together. Um, so it was effective. So, well, but there were there were questions about Israel and 9-11, you know, concerning the Israeli... There's questions about everything. There's, que there's questions about everything. Well, we don't have many answers, but there's questions about everything. That yes. doesn't, you know, there's questions about... You know, that, that's, that's what the anti-vaccine people say. You know, it's like, well, we're just asking questions. No, you're, you're asking qu loaded questions. You're asking, you know, when did you stop beating your wife? That's what you're asking. And well, you know, no, the I... questions that arise, yes, certainly. Israel is closely related to the U.S. We have a somewhat shared intelligence apparatus that works in concert with each other. And all of this is on display. And if you, you, know, you look closely at the events of 9-11, Israel is in the mix. Well, but when you look at when you ask the question like, why did Dominic Souter flee the United States within days of 9/11? I think that's a valid question. He was the owner of Urban Moving Systems, who, you know, the, the, those five Israelis were arrested. They happened to work for that company. Why did he flee the United States? I, I, I have questions about that. I think that's a valid question, but it doesn't it doesn't prove that Israel was behind 9/11. That, right. It doesn't do that at all. But it's a legitimate question, I think. It, it's a legitimate question, and I, I don't think that we have the access. No, we don't. To, and that's something I want to, to get to into. Information. And, you know, again, you know, we've got questions and we've got facts. And even the facts, as I said earlier, could be a very 
funny thing to deal with, like 12 angry men. You know, you could lay the facts on the table, and they could all point in a certain direction, and, and they could, it, it still could be the wrong conclusion that you come to. And if you're going to well, now when, extend this to questions, like, well, this guy seemed suspicious in his behavior. He left the country, and he, you know, well, well certainly, there, there, there's something going on there uh, that we don't understand. And it really is more telling about the people who will connect those dots than it is about the facts themselves. It's more telling that one person will look at that set of questions and say, Israel did it. And it's not a coincidence that it's the same people who are saying the Holocaust didn't happen. Gee, what is the common theme running through these these ideas? Well, the, you know, the idea that Israel did it or, you know, the Mossad was involved, I think those ideas actually originated in the Middle East. Um, in fact, Danny oh. Pearl, uh, who worked for the Wall Street Journal, he interviewed somebody, I, I don't remember his name, and he, you know, he was very early on said that Israel did this. So that, you know, was being put out there um, early on. Yeah. And then there were people who saying there were no Jews killed in the towers. Right. That's just, right. you know, horrible, horrible information. Yes, the Jew, Jews were killed in the towers. I think Muslims were killed in the towers. There were so many different kinds of people that were killed in the towers. And, you know, when, when they say, when people say that the Jews did 9-11, that's just as insulting as saying that the Muslims did 9-11, in my opinion. You know, um, I, that, that's another problem that the 9-11 truth movement faced, unfortunately, which was bigotry. There was people, you know, I because I'm Jewish, I was born Jewish, I had a bar mitzvah, my last name is Gold. Because of that fact, there were so many narratives that were created about me being some kind of agent for Larry Silverstein because I had questions about the idea of controlled demolition. Um, there were people who actually spread a rumor that I was paying people not to talk about Israel and 9-11. It's so absolutely ridiculous. I was the very first person on 9-11 Blogger to post about the Israeli art students, and we had this whole introduction you know, explaining how questioning Israel does not mean that you hate Jews. And I was a Jew. I was the one promoting that information. So it was just you know, then they, they would say I was a self-hating Jew or, or something to that effect. And I, I, I've promoted so much information over the years about Israel um, as far as Gaza is concerned, as far as, you know, being involved in the wiretapping of this country. It, it's just, it's unbelievable that, that people call me, you know, um, a Zionist mole, you know, that kind, that kind of stuff. And I got a lot of that shit over the years. And I'm, I'm sorry to be cursing, but one thing I want to talk about, you said we didn't have access. Now, is it our job as citizens to do an investigation, or is it our job as citizens to demand that a real investigation transpires and that all questions are answered, or is it a little bit of both? Well, you know, it goes back to... Uh you know, what I said earlier, which is we have a dilemma on our hands um, in that we live in an era where um, information is, is very controlled and it's in a digital format, which means it could be changed, it could be erased, it could be, uh, it could be transmitted uh, at the speed of light, basically, around the world. Uh, a lie, you know, Mark Twain said, uh, is, is said to have said, no one has any proof he said it, but which is ironic, but he said a lie could get halfway around the world before the truth can get out of bed and get its boots on. And, <laughs> well, that, and, that, was, and that was the 1800s, okay? Right. That was the 1800s. We're living in the 21st century now, and a lie can go around the world multiple times while the truth gets smothered in its sleep. Well, I want to talk about that for a second because there was a, a theory that was put out very early on in October 2001. Um, I think it was the Voltaire Network, um, which Ferry, French reporter, I think it's 
Ferry Mason, is that his name? Uh, they put out an article suggesting that Flight 77 did not hit the Pentagon. And then I think Ferry Mason wrote a book about it. I think it was translated into 29 different languages and put out throughout the world. And that's how that theory, I think, got started. And when you look at that theory, the idea that Flight 77 or an American Airlines jet did not strike the Pentagon, there's debris with the American Airlines logo at the Pentagon. Um, you know, people say, well, they planted that. Okay, well, do you have proof of that? I mean, it, it's just people who say that it's planted discredit themselves, in my opinion. Um, when they say things like that, there, there's, you know, they identified the DNA of the passengers and the crew. Um, apparently, there, there was a book called uh, Firefight that talk, was a book about by the responders um, that talked about how there were um, seats from the plane with bodies still strapped to them. Um, and, you know, I've read people who, who tried to counter this by saying the book was propaganda and, and stuff like that. But you've got to have proof that these people are lying. You know, you just can't say that something is planted or that somebody is lying because it doesn't coincide with what you think happened. Um, another thing with the Pentagon is the witnesses. How many witnesses saw a commercial airline or a plane strike the Pentagon that morning. There were a multitude of, of witnesses. Um, you know, it's just an, it's an absurd theory. I wish people would ask the question, you know, how is it possible that the most defended airspace in the world was left completely undefended 34 minutes after the second tower was hit when everybody in the world knew America was under attack, and yet the most defended airspace in the world was left completely undefended and a commercial airliner managed to, to hit the Pentagon. Why does nobody make that question the priority? Um, instead, now we have these theories about how, uh, you know, not only not, not did Flight 77 not hit the Pentagon, but now we hear that Flight 77 flew over the Pentagon and dropped a bomb, or we hear that it was a missile and not Flight 77, or we hear that it was a global hawk. Uh, and now we, we're hearing that there were explosives planted at the Pentagon from people, in the, not only in, in the buildings, but now in the Pentagon. Um, John, we, we live in an era where facts don't, really matter anymore. I, I, I don't know how else, you know. People tell me that all the time, and I just, you know, I facts can't. Don't, facts don't, you don't understand why other people don't embrace this issue. When you look around you, and the American public is running in circles Looking for Obama's birth certificate. Oh God, do you or, remember? Or, or, or not taking their vaccines because it will cause autism, or uh, claiming that the Sandy Hook shooting, which tomorrow is the anniversary, didn't even happen. They were all yeah, that was it. horrible. Within hours of the Sandy Hook shooting, there were people saying that it was a false flag. There were people saying that it was the Mossad. I think it was Gordon Duff and Jim Fetzer who gave, you know, a lot of problems to the 9-11 truth movement. I, I um, think that we, a, we, live in a, we live in an era where people have disaster exhaustion. Okay, you think of all the things that happened after 9-11. You know, it, some of them were political, some of them were just natural events, like the, the terrible tsunami that hit uh, the Indian Ocean, killing 300,000 people. And then there was uh, Iraq, and then there was the nuclear meltdown in Japan and the earthquake that happened there. And it, it seems like there's just this constant unfolding of terrible events, the financial collapse, 
you know, you're asking why people don't care about 9-11 when people are losing their jobs and they're losing their 401k plans and everyone's working uh, menial. Okay, well, then let's talk about why it's important. And our government is doing nothing. And, you know, we don't live in a country where people are dedicated to causes anymore. And the causes that they are dedicated to are often based on rubbish. Based on well, let's talk about pro- let's talk about why been told, people are told what to believe, and they believe it. Okay, let's talk and, about why getting justice, truth, and accountability for 9/11 is still an important issue. Aside from the fact that 2,976 people were brutally murdered that day, and you know nobody's been held accountable, nobody in government how many is people, held accountable. John? How many people died in Iraq? No, I understand that, but the reason that they were able to go into Iraq was because of 9-11. Let's look at the reason they were able to go into the reason why 9-11 happened is, is, you know... We don't know. We We don't don't know. know, But we we do know is that uh, we don't know what we don't know, and that there's been a long string of injustices you know, the overthrow of governments in South America and Pinochet yeah, and the Gulf of Tonkin affair and Vietnam. And I Iraq. understand that, but I, I, wanted, so I wanted to draw the line. Go ahead. You want to draw the line, but, you know, you know, some people are saying we need to draw the line with the environment. Some people are saying we need to draw the line with uh, UFOs. <laughs> Some people are saying we need to draw the line with uh, all of this police violence. You know, the police violence is a terrible thing. Some people are all up in arms over Bill Cosby. There's no centralized light at yeah, the end of this just, tunnel. Just yesterday, I mean, okay, I, I wrote a list yesterday of things that 9-11 was used as for the justification of which, you know, going into Afghanistan, going into Iraq, drone bombing, countries like Somalia, Pakistan, Yemen, torture, Gitmo, um, uh, the NDAA, um, the Patriot Act. Um, you know, John Brennan, oh my God, he gave a, a talk uh, in response to the the torture report, and the first thing he said was, he started his sentence with, it was 8:46 a.m. You know, he was he was using 9/11 to justify the torture that took place after 9/11, and okay. you know, it, it, it's so you, there are so like many it, things that 9/11 you feel like is it's used the one, on. Well, well, yes, but some people can make the argument that since the assassination of John Kennedy, the military-industrial complex has consolidated its stranglehold of politics and world domination and empire, because that's what that was all about. This is what some people would say, that that assassination was all about the military-industrial complex and America exerting hegemony over the entire world, as well as its own political system. So you could say if we exposed this lie, all the other dominoes would fall. All these other bad things that happened as a result of the military-industrial complex all started with John F. Kennedy's assassination. So let's all divert our energy to proving that. Let's just say we need truth and justice for the Kennedy assassination. The problem with that for me is that I know very many, well, I know a lot of 9-11 family members, and I know a lot of their stories, and I know their descriptions of the pain that they went through. I could never possibly understand what it was like. And for 9-11, for me, you know, it happened, and I was just like everybody else in the country. I wanted revenge. I wanted to, to bomb the shit out of the Middle East. I wanted to carpet bomb the Middle East. And I've since learned that that was wrong, but I, I'm just saying I was just like everybody else, and, you know, I, I learned over time that that, that was wrong, and I, I, I don't know. I, to, to not, I felt like, for 
for 9-11, we were lied to, and I, it, 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 to me, the best analogy I can come up with is I felt like a rape victim. I felt like these people raped me with fear and and all of this stuff, this, all of these lies. Um, that's the best analogy I can come up with. And I'm sure a lot of people felt that way about 9-11, and I can't imagine being a 9-11 family member, knowing what we know about 9-11, and having, having lost someone that day on top of it. It's just an unimaginable to me, and they deserve better than what they got in, in the 9-11 congressional inquiry and the 9-11 commission. Um, well, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of people who are, you know, deserve... A lot more but again, 9/11 is you used know, as, as a justification you know, I... for so many things. If we take away their 9/11 playing card, then it takes away the justification for all of the horrible things that they they've done in the name of that day. That that's a very simple argument. You know, we're living in the post 9/11 world where we preemptively attack countries. We take away our civil liberties. Okay, what would take away that? Let, let, let's get down to to the nuts and bolts of this. What would take away that playing card? Were we not by exposing the fact that we were lied to about nine eleven? Okay, they lied to us. What does what does that get us? Because yeah, they well, they've also us. earned, in, in my opinion, you know, I look at nine eleven as a crime and not an act of war. And as okay, with so every crime, there are that's suspects that's for that crime. And okay. I believe that elements within our government and other governments have more than earned the title of suspect for the crime of 9-11. I can't prove it beyond a shadow of doubt, but there is certainly information out there that suggests it. So I, I think it would be irresponsible of us as citizens to ignore that information, especially considering what that day has been used for. And you know, John, John, irresponsible is our middle name. I, I mean, this country is irresponsible on a scale that, you know, historians a millennium from now are going to talk about us in, in ways that we can't imagine. Okay, we're destroying the planet itself. There's actually literally an existential threat to every living being on this planet as a result of our aggressive, unbending need for resources and the burnings of fossil fuels, and just a system that is unsustainable, that enslaves much of the world in its paradigm, and is destroying the environment in the process. And that's, that's the threat that we're faced with right now. And you could ask, why aren't Americans mobilizing on that issue? Because Americans don't care. I mean, that's really the bottom line here. They've had more than ample time to digest the facts, not just about the environment, about the injustices in the financial system. So many people were so hurt by what happened in 2008. No, no criminal investigations. Nobody went to jail for it. No accountability. No truth. We had a few weeks of Occupy Wall Street. It all evaporated overnight. Half of the Americans out there wanted the police to crack their heads open. That's how sick we are as a culture. We're well, vote, voting against our own interests. But again, that interest. goes back to the to the corporate media to a great extent because they well, well, sure. They create. Yeah, I, I, I know why. I know why it's happening. But you know, do do I hold out hope that any one of these triggers? is going to change the course of history, because I think that's what you're looking for here. You're looking for some Rosetta Stone, some flaming sword in the darkness. You're looking for a smoking gun that is going to make Americans say, oh, this is the one. This is the one where we, we all throw the bums out of Washington and take back this country and we put an end to all the injustices, the social injustices, that is the, the uh, drone bombings in the Middle East and, and uh, you know, invasions of foreign lands and the military industrial complex. I, I you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't know that 9-11 
has been it's not this, it, You don't think 9-11 what? I don't know that 9-11 at this stage, like the Kennedy assassination, like more pressing current issues like the environment. I mean, California's underwater right now, you know. Uh, no, I, you know, the, I understand there, there all of that. There are super typhoons. There are super typhoons sweeping around this globe right now. The levels of carbon dioxide in the air are unprecedented. I'm really not asking people to make 9-11 the issue for them. What I'm asking of people is, you know, people like Chris Hedges, people like Glenn Greenwald, people who don't talk about the fact that we were lied to about 9-11. I'm trying to get a majority of people to at least acknowledge the fact that we were lied to about that day. I want there to be, com I want it to be common knowledge among every American. I want them to say it. You know, when when people talk about the war on terror, when people talk about the things that are going on in the Middle East, I want them to talk about the fact that we were lied to about the day that justifies all of these actions. That's that's what I'm asking for. And you can also incorporate you know the, the other issues that you're talking about i you know i post every day about all kinds of issues but my main focus has been 9-11 you know my friend eric said that when i started doing 9-11 i was like a pit bull that bit down and refused to let go and he was very much right i still you know i i have i have breakfast with bob McElveen every every week and we talk about 9-11, and I hear him talk about how his son died and how he thinks that he died from explosions in the building and, and stuff like that. It breaks my heart. It, it, sure, and, I, I, and, and, you know, my heart's broken over, you know, the, uh, you know the, the number of children that are going without food right now as a result right. of a system that is so heartless that would let people die today as opposed to 14 years ago. And, you know, the problem is that you're giving people more credit than they deserve. I don't think so. I think people... I, you know, I, I think I, that... I think you know, people Bill Maher, generally you know, good. There's, there's a political pundit on HBO, Bill Maher, uh, who's taken... I don't always agree with everything he says, but he says some good things once in a while. And, you know, he took a lot of flack for uh, saying that Americans are stupid. You know, they, they went all over, you know, the media with him. He's calling Americans stupid. Of course, Fox News had a field day with it. And, you know, the fact of the matter is when you look at the statistics of what people believe in this country, when you say something, I, I just I simply want a majority of people to acknowledge the truth of 9-11 when, you know, there's, there's a huge proportion of people in this country that don't even believe in evolution. They don't believe in evolution. They don't believe in climate change. They think Obama doesn't have a birth certificate. He was born in ten years. And they're, they're wrong. And they need to. They're wrong. They're wrong. You know, and they they need to be shown why they're wrong. If they don't believe it, people have that, the right to believe if whatever the hell they want. Would, but but, if, but I, you see, I don't see that as an angle for change. I don't see trying to rock. Get all the village idiots together to see my point of view on things. Oh, okay. So see, I don't not think... in this environment. Not in this world, not this world, okay? Not with the, the media, with the power that it has over the Internet or the power that it has over television. I don't see gaining traction for the truth anytime see, soon. I don't think – I don't look at people as stupid because I'm – or I was – with regards That's to 9-11, I was just as stu – hold, hold on, let me finish. I was just as stupid as everyone else. Um, after 9-11, about 9-11, and today I'm somebody who knows more than most people about 9-11. But, but I'm not smarter than anybody. Hold on, hold on. I'm not smarter than anybody. John, John, you are smarter. You are, you are smarter than the average American, I think. I think that I, you have a sense of introspective, you have an introspective quality that lets you, you know, look at things and, you know, you feel these things very deeply. That, that's another problem here. You expect people to feel things. And <laughs> Americans, 
<laughs> you expect people to feel the things that you're feeling, and I, I don't know that the empathy is out there. You know, we, we, we're great at, at, you know, platitudes. We're great at, like, we will never forget, and then a day later we forget. You know, we, we say those, those first responders are heroes, and then we let them die of cancer without medical health. And we say we will always thank our veterans. We love them, and then we don't give them health care, and no one cares, and put them on a waiting list until they die. Okay? People love jingoism. They love platitudes. They love this bullshit patriotism where you put a magnet on your car and you say, I will never forget, and a day later, it's forgotten. And people care about fast food, and they care about their TV shows, and they care about well, their jobs. And they're, they're what, are, what are the solutions? Survive. And people aren't interested or even, you know, the, believing that everyone possesses the empathy that you have. Well, I, want to, I, would, I just want to say that this discussion was going to be, you know, mostly on, you know, disinformation, how it affects movements, and, and it turned into you know, how, what it, what it is now. Um, and I just, you know, what are the solutions to these issues? How do we resolve these issues? And uh, that's what I was hoping to do today was to well, give it, people it, good it, advice as to, as to how to approach the 9-11 issue or any other issue. How, wh what's a good way, if you want to, talk to somebody about 9-11, if you want to convince somebody that we are lied to about 9-11, what is the best way for someone to do that, in your opinion, if, if you thought, if you think it's important anymore? Well, it, it's important. Uh, it's, in, it's important up there with many other things that are important that are just as heartbreaking and just as unjust and involve mass casualties and families being ripped apart and uh, all sorts of things, what will break America from its reverie and, you know, awaken the American public so that we could have some real change? I, I think we need real political change in this country. I think we need something akin to a social revolution where we really shake out the government and we, we really move people into positions of power where they could start opening these files on the Kennedy assassination, on climate change, on 9-11, on Iraq, on torture, and really start to hold people accountable in, in a criminal way, holding people accountable. But that will take a social revolution to get people convinced that this is an existential threat to our survival here. If we don't get control of this Frankenstein monster that we've created, which is the military industrial complex, but even worse, the corporate international, the international corporations that are literally a threat to every man, woman, and child on this planet right now. Unless we get a handle on that, change the political system enough that we could actually shake it out and get people into positions of power that can get at the truth. Not a matter of getting the support of the masses. People know things are fucked up. It's just there's a sense of hopelessness out there. But nothing well, but, do is gonna ch is gonna change anything. Even something as tragic as the shooting of, at Sandy Hook, we can't even get sensible laws on the books for background checks, for guns. We can't even do the simple things anymore. The so things you're like saying 9-11 and climate change, I don't think it's a matter of approaching people. It's a matter of organizing people for real change, which is a social revolution. Of course, I'm not talking about a violent revolution. I'm talking about a real political revolution to unseat those who are in power and create a new system in its place that's going to put accountability as the first order of business. Oh, I, I agree. Accountability. Kind of what happened in South Africa, you know? They, they, you know, on a very small scale, but they came in and they said, we're going to open all the books and we're going to declare everything that went wrong and we're going to, you know, give people a clear line of sight into the truth 
Well, didn't they have a truth and reconciliation committee, which essentially people were were telling the truth and they were let off the hook to to some extent? Yeah. See, I don't want people let off the hook. I want people held accountable for their actions. So, well, I might not, I might not exactly follow the uh, the uh, uh, South Africa model, but you get the gist of what I'm saying. Uh, you know, it, it's a matter of we need a change in power in the power structure and but we can't use the election process I, I, don't, to, I don't think convincing individual citizens of any fact one way or another in this environment i could convince them you know that you know this about controlled demolition or that about no planes or, or stuff that i think is credible i don't think that's going to affect any real change in, in the world i live in I, well, I, I definitely think that bottlenecking the message of the 9-11 truth movement with controlled demolition has been a disaster. Um, well, I agree. You know, I think it was one of the most effective ways to shut it down. Well, I, I never questioned how those buildings came down until I was introduced to the 9-11 truth movement. And when I first heard the theory, I thought it sounded batshit crazy. And my thoughts were that if it's crazy to me, someone who is already fighting for 9-11 justice, who's already on board, I can't imagine how crazy it must sound to people, you know, we, are, we were trying to educate. Um, and, you know, Michael Rupert, who, who killed himself this year, uh, very early on, he had a movie called The Truth and Lies About 9-11. Um, and there was something that he said in that movie that, made a lot of sense to me, and it, it, quote, there is a procedure that you follow when you are presenting evidence. There is a way that you structure evidence to avoid speculation. So some of the things we are not going to talk about tonight are speculations about the attacks on September 11th. We are not going to talk about were there explosives in the buildings, were the planes piloted by remote control. Now, there is another way to take on the government. There is another way to take on the lunacy of the mass media, and that is by using their own statements and their own evidence against them to prove that they are lying. Um, and I guess, you know, in some ways, that that's the end of the quote, by the way. Um, I guess in some ways you can apply this to, to what NIST has said, um, you know, but... Rupert was very influential to a lot of people in the beginning. And in the beginning, a lot of the people shied away from controlled demolition. If you just look at the 9-11 omission hearings, um, the 9-11 congressional briefing, there was no talk of controlled demolition. Um, you know, and, and there were people in the 9-11 truth movement who were trying to make the argument of controlled demolition the argument um, but there was also the corporate media who painted us as people who think the buildings were brought down by a controlled demolition and that a missile hit the Pentagon, and that there were also debunkers in, who, in the very beginning, only talked about controlled demolition. So there were many fronts trying to make it the issue, and from a PR standpoint, you know, as I said, bottlenecking our message into the theory of controlled demolition has been a, a disaster in my opinion. I've had 12 shows that have talked about a multitude of issues concerning the 9-11 attacks, and I think I have proven beyond the shadow of doubt that we were lied to about 9-11, and I haven't even mentioned the buildings. And I, I don't think that you should have to be a scientist, an engineer, a physicist to understand that we were lied to about 9-11 and that there is a need for real truth, justice, and accountability. And having said all of that, you know, there are family members who question this report. And admittedly, I have some questions about it myself. Apparently, there are some things they refuse to release. And I am all about transparency regarding 9-11. Um, so if the question of how those buildings came down is important to the families, or at least to some of them, then it's important to me. The 9-11 families did, after all, submit a question to the 9-11 Commission about WTC-7.
but I don't think that it should be the core message of this cause. I think, you know, supporting the 9-11 family members, uh, trying to put an end to the, these wars and everything that's being done in the name of that day, but keeping it simple. You know, we were lied to. The 9-11 Commission was a complete farce, and that's so easy to prove. Um, you know, there are, there are just simple lies to show that you, you don't need all these uh, theories um, to, to get your point across. But anyway, you know, that, that's what I have to say about controlled demolition. But what else were we talking about? <laughs> Well, you know, it, it, in many respects, what happened with 9-11 Truth and controlled demolition was a model for what came after. And, you know, again, we live in an era where facts and actual science uh, takes a backseat to pseudoscience. Um, you know, somebody made the point that you know, 97% of scientists who have published papers on the issue of climate change are in support of the idea that it's man-made where the cause and the effect is climate change, temperatures rising. But when you see it depicted on TV, they'll have one person defending climate change and another person against it. And you know, really, you should have 97 people sitting at the podium and one person. Uh, it's not a fair argument. And when you elevate junk science, like climate change is caused by sunspots, a minority position in the extreme, when you elevate junk science and junk facts to the same platform and say, well, it's just in the interest of debate. Aren't we allowed to have free and open debate? Well, then you open up everything to debate. The world is flat. Evolution didn't happen, which, by the way, is still being debated in some textbooks well, in, in the South. Whether that brings up another debate. issue. That brings up another issue. And, you know, as I said earlier, human nature, when they're not answering your questions, is to speculate as to the reasons why. Everybody has theories. The, the, quite, the difference is putting theories forward publicly. Um, you know, I, I've had so many email exchanges with people talking about different theories about what I think might have happened on 9-11 and been talking about information. But I didn't take those theories, you know, and go out and say, this is what happened. I, I just talked about it amongst people, but there are some people who, talk to, who put everything out there on the table. It didn't matter what it was. You know, the, the space beams brought down the towers, that the planes that we saw hit the buildings were, in fact, CGI, you know, that there were mini nukes, that the phone calls were fake. Can you imagine the family members who think they who heard from their loved ones that day being told that their the, the phone calls they got were fake that they, they weren't actually their loved ones? It's just well, can you well can you imagine losing a child uh, in Sandy Hook and and having someone call you and say your child never existed? It, it was a conspiracy to for to take our guns away. Or the you know, the well, people were actors. In, you know, yeah. the, 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 well, that's, the, that's people... the ongoing theory that this is, you know, that, that it's, uh, you know, the entire event was staged and everyone was actors and the parents were actors and the kids didn't exist. And the school itself was not a real school. It was a closed building. And the pictures we saw were only a couple of act actors and actresses and children actors. But, you know, again, you understand that when you open the debate up to every arbitrary, insane theory, you make it impossible to have any real accountability because... Well, what I learned over the years is to stop bother, stop being, you know, for years we were called what was, we were known as like the credibility police. We would come in and you put this theory forward and we would explain the reasons why it, it doesn't make any sense. And, you know, we got a lot of flack for that. And the only reason that we were doing it was because we were trying to maintain the credibility of the cause. And well, and it's, and it's beyond 9-11. The, the whole idea of a truth movement at a time when, you know, John Dean, you know, described that administration as worse than Nixon. And he said it was, the, you know, the most secretive administration he in his lifetime could remember. 
and he works for Nixon. <laughs> you know, when he, right. you know, the most secretive administration that that he had ever seen, and the idea that that could coexist with a truth movement that is calling for accountability again on a whole slew of issues associated with the reasoning and the justification for going into Iraq, what our relationships were with some of the main actors in, in all of this, and Al-Qaeda and who Osama bin Laden was. And, you know, this is something that I don't think our government is interested in encouraging. Our government is and, definitely not interested in interested encouraging. In, right. So I think the solution has been that They've created an environment, and I think it is engineered. I, you know, the, there's, uh, there's a story in the news recently that China has employed as many as 300,000 trolls. They don't use that word, but people who go on the Internet and go on to, uh, you know, forums and disrupt and spread disinformation and just basically do the government's bidding in terms of propaganda. And China's doing it, and we know that there was a story a while ago that Israel was involved in seeding the American Internet with people who were pro-Israeli, uh, pro-war uh, perspectives in the lead-up to Iraq. And the, the Snowden released documents showing that, uh, you know, in the U.K., you know, he had well, a there's, a, presentation. there's an article from Glenn, Glenn Greenwald called how covert agents infiltrate the internet to manipulate, deceive, and destroy reputations. And that's exactly. available. And, you know, the, so the idea that the largest military industrial complex in the world, with the biggest budget of them all, bigger than all the other countries combined, the United States of America is letting the internet be a free and open space for everyone to have open space is, is kind of like laughable. Uh, to think that they're not involved in shaping political perspectives and opinions. And if you look at the current environment on the Internet, what's going on is it, it's, it's just completely crazy. I mean, no theory is too insane to gain traction and to become like the prevalent perspective on any subject. Well, that's why I ask that just... You know, this is the message that I'm trying to convey in, in this interview, is for people to be careful, to trust themselves over everyone else. Um, don't believe everything you hear. Don't believe everything you, you, you see. Um, you know, be very careful with how you approach the 9-11 issue or any other issue. Um, try to put forward the best information possible you know, I used to think that the 2,976 people that were murdered on 9-11, you know, they can no longer speak for themselves, so we have to speak for them, for their for their justice and their accountability. And I, I try to put things in terms that just, you know, that people understand that it's important, why it's important. And, um, you know, one thing that we did years ago is we, we did a, a declaration for how people should act or coincide with others with, with regard or promoting information. It had to do with how to promote information, what's good information. It was called the 2008 Declaration. Um, it's available at truthmove.org. We spent a lot of time on that, trying, you know, it was you, me, uh, Julian, uh, I think the Donna Marshall Connor was involved. Um, Nick Levis was involved, and we spent, you know, we were experienced people who had gone through all the bullshit of the 9/11 Truth Movement, and we we tried to take that experience and put it into a a, a reasonable, suggestive format for people, you know, on how to to deal with this issue. And we were we were attacked for that. We were attacked. Well, well yeah, but you know that, that that's you know you you can't wake a man who's feigning sleep. You know you can't expect the cooperation of people who are intentionally, by design, intending to undermine your efforts. Uh, 
you know, the idea that you can craft a language that is so reasonable that it will sway the hearts and minds of your enemies is is where we made our fatal mistake. We we should have gone to war with these people. We should have fought them as hard as we could fight them and have a zero tolerance level for um, any of them. And we should have created so, but again, that falls back. while we while we still had the numbers, we should have created a parallel movement that said, you know, we, we are actively we should have declared it. We're actively being disrupted and infiltrated and you know, we have a zero tolerance at this stage of the game for uh, the big tent theory, which is come one, come all, bring whatever crazies, assorted nuts with you, uh, anti, you know, anti-Jews, uh, you know, anti-Semitic types, and uh, no planers, and the no plane at the Pentagon, and controlled demolition, and all the rest of it. And, you know, we should have just held the line in a unified way. But there was there was no appetite for that. I can remember endless conference calls with the supposed leadership of 9/11 Truth and being, you know, uh, basically put down for even suggesting that we should fight back. We didn't want to lower ourselves to their level. We didn't want to make accusations because that was, you know, that's what they were doing, and we weren't going to do the same thing. And instead, what we ended up was with uh, uh, weak sauce 9/11 Truth. What we ended up was watered down, crazy. Well, what happened was out. people left. People, good people who were trying to make a okay. difference, they moved on because they were tired of the bullshit. And as I was saying, you know, we were the credibility police for a while trying to save the credibility of this cause. And I found that it's so fucking time consuming that it's better to just be active and just try to do positive things. And that's one thing I want to convey to people about who to trust, about who you think you can trust, is but look at people at the fruits of their labor, okay? Look at their track record over the years. Um, have they been consistent? Have they admitted to mistakes? You know, Cindy Sheehan is one of the most consistent people there is out there. Um, with, you know, when Obama came into office, she was grilling him right away about, you know, stopping the Iraq wars. She was grilling him about sending more troops into Afghanistan. I mean, we were all, we were all doing it. I was doing it, but she's just been consistent. And so her, you know, she may have made some mistakes over the years, but consistently she's been a, a great activist. So I trust Cindy. And, you know, unfortunately, the amount of people that I trust is is, is very small. I wish it was – I wish I could trust everybody, but I can't. And, because and, you know, if, if, we, if we're looking for a solution, if we want success, we have to start by looking in the mirror, and we have to start by asking ourselves, why isn't this working? You know, we've been, you know, you've been doing this for years, and the American public doesn't seem interested in the topic. It hasn't gained traction, and we also have to ask ourselves why the American public also isn't interested in many of the other facts that are out there that are even more substantial in terms of the financial collapse and climate change. We have scientists. You know, we have well-funded scientists who are telling us something, and the American public just doesn't seem to be able to organize itself, organize its thinking on it. Uh, American public's not interested in activism. That's the central question here. Unless we get over the hurdle of finding a way to, first of all, reach our audience and then get them motivated, because you know, there's a, there's a lack of motivation out there. And I don't think it, it's just because they haven't gotten the truth, because controlled demolition poisoned their thinking on one issue or another. I think it's because there's a psychological problem here. <laughs> the patient well, is, uh, you know, is anesthetized, and we haven't found a way to wake it up. And, you know, unless we confront that problem face on none of these issues, 9-11, climate change, Iraq, 
the Kennedy assassination. You could just go on and on. Everyone has their pet topic that they think is the most important topic. But the overriding message here is that the American public as a whole, as a body politic, is not interested in legislating change or creating change in the streets. It's hopeful that people are protesting against police violence, but unfortunately, police violence serious as it may be, is maybe the least of our problems. Well, actually, it's one of the biggest problems we have because when you try to protest and you're hit over the head with a baton, you know, we we supposedly have the right to, to protest and address our government with the redress of grievances and, and all that wonderful stuff that's in the Constitution. So when, you know, when they refuse to allow you to do that, that is a problem. So it, it and oh, it's, a problem. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's a problem. It's a problem. I'm not trying to minimize the problem. When I say it's the least of our problems, you know, I think you know. And one thing I want to talk the about is sustainability. If I had to pick one problem, I, I think it's the unsustainability of capitalism and our inability to, you know, dethrone those who are in corporate positions of power with non-renewable sources of energy that we're dependent upon and our, you know, the resource wars, because that's what these wars are about, the wars for resources, uh, the mindset that you know, American imperialism and American empire uh, is going to uh, you know, s- secure its future through its actions that it, it's taken over the last decade, uh, that's the biggest threat to the world. And I don't limit it to what's a threat to American public. The police in America, big problem. The threat to the planet, bigger problem. Yeah, absolutely. But again, you know, I'm not, I'm trying to take away the the 9-11 playing card. I'm not asking people to make 9-11 the issue for them, like it has been for me, but I at least want them to acknowledge the truth. And the truth is, we were lied to about a great many things concerning the 9/11 attacks. And how would that? Un- be- but how would that? But how would that? How would that unfold? How would you get the government to surrender to that issue? What the government. I don't want the government to surrender to that issue. I want the people to acknowledge that issue. Okay, so I let's want- say everybody acknowledges it. So then, what happens? Then, then maybe they can't use 9/11 like they just did. John Brennan wouldn't be able to do what he just did. And maybe, you know, now, maybe... What's the mechanism? What's the mechanism for stopping people, them? People, what is the mechanism for what? For stopping them. For example, 90% of the American public wants background checks for guns, but we still don't have it. it doesn't well, you, you like stop it paying your taxes, you stop, you stop supporting the corporations by buying their goods. You know, there's a, there's a number of things that you can do that... It can, is considered to be a revolution, and a revolution isn't a bad thing. It's just a radical change, and I can't think of anything this country needs more than a radical change. Um, All right, so then but, we should be activists for radical change. Uh, I don't know how what getting what people believe. You know, you see, they're, they're two different things. You know, what people believe. They believe 9/11. We were lied to on 9/11. What they don't believe it. I don't see how either mindset leads to change. Now, the well, if you believe that we were lied to about taxes, let, let's look taxes, at this logic. Why change things, but you know, you could get them to not pay their taxes for a whole bunch of other reasons too. Let's look so at what this you logically. Do, you if you, an go ahead. If you if you get people to acknowledge the fact that we were lied to about 9/11, then they're going to start thinking that you know what. There was no reason for any of these wars that are going on. There was no reason to take away our civil liberties like they have. There was no reason to expand executive power. There's no reason to to be able to assassinate Americans. You know, they lied to it. When, these are all things that 9-11 are used as a justification for. If you tell people or people are convinced that we were lied to, then maybe they'll start thinking about those other issues that are going on that are just horrible, that we're taking part in, 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 the, in across the pond on the other side of the planet uh, and, and within this country. 
I I just I, I can't see how you don't you don't acknowledge that we were lied to and then start to move on to those other things. I just don't see how you, you don't do it. <laughs> it the just seems is, like there are there, but the thing is there there are still huge numbers of people who have profound insights into what's going on, that we're in a very precarious situation, that, you know, our system is corrupt, that, um, you know, the, the, there is an existential threat to the planet, that there are a lot of social injustices going on in the financial system as well as mass casualties, hundreds of thousands dead, based on wars that we were misled and lied to, about people do you have mean awareness of these, <laughs> including 9/11. People are aware of these things, but I don't. I don't know that they are. Change, it doesn't change I, the, the power structure. It's. It, I don't. I don't think it's a. You know, as as easy as just getting people to acknowledge a specific issue. I think that the no, of they, how they do we, how do we organize in this country? How do we organize? to get people to make them do the things that need to be done to get true accountability, to open the You show line, them why it's open important. Line. You show them why it's important. I mean, we're doing so many things around it, the world like right the now. Six part, there was a six-part documentary on HBO showing people the effects of climate change, that like we'll all be underwater, that you know, like millions of people will be displaced that wars could break out all over the world, that we could lo lose our food supply, <laughs> you know, make people aware of the stakes. You know, we're constantly bombarded with inconvenient truths and horrible realities. Well, I but drew the line at 9-11. And, you know, when, when I think about what John Brennan did yesterday and I think about being a 9-11 family member, knowing what we know, watching him do that, it's just inconceivable to me. I, I, I don't. It's unimaginable to me to 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 be in their shoes, and they deserve better. Anyway, John, we've been going on for two hours now. Um, is there anything that you want to end on? Well, you know, I I, I hope that nothing I said uh, offends you. Uh, I I think what you're doing is a noble cause. I think anybody who uh, cares as much about an issue as much as you care about this issue um, is is fighting a noble fight. And, you know, I, I think that at the heart of it, um, you know, you, you've put a lot of time into the research on this, and I, I think that you've focused on things uh, that are very credible as opposed to a lot of the disinformation and misinformation that's out there. And... I think it's important that people like you exist. I, I think, you know, I'm hoping for a spiritual awakening at some point, maybe when things get bad enough, and that 9-11 will be a very important cornerstone in people understanding some of the ugly realities that may exist in this well, world. Well, we, we came together. We came together after 9-11. We came together after 9-11, like, like never before, it, it, you know, it, since Pearl Harbor. And, you know, I I was hoping, praying, I, I don't pray, I don't believe in God, but I was hoping that, you know, people could come together for 9-11 again, but this time for the right reasons, you know, to demand accountability, to demand truth, to demand real justice. And, well, I and hope not, that that happens too, John. I, I, I do. Uh, you know, I, I hope that that happens, and I, you know, I'm glad that people like you exist. You know, I, I, I'm glad that there are people who are dedicated to the cause of truth on a whole preponderance of issues. You know, there's a lot of things that really scare me about the world, a lot of things that break my heart about the world. You know, I, I put myself at considerable risk taking on this cause, and you know, early on, it, there were a lot of threats to my safety. There was a lot of uh, aggravation and personalized attacks, and as you're aware of, and it, it's because I felt something, and I continue to feel something. It's just I, I have a wider 
range of feelings now for a lot of things that are going on. And I hope so that there is a spiritual awakening, and I ho- I'm glad that people like you exist because when the time comes that people are ready to rise from their slumber, it's important that you're still there and that you're still ready to give them what they need in terms of the facts and give them access to this issue. I'm glad well, that I hope I totally am still away. there. You know, I, I, I'm glad that the issue didn't totally go away. You know, it, it was buried under a mountain of disinformation to the point where I don't even know what the truth is anymore. I, I really don't. Well, we don't never advocate. knew what the truth was. I became a better activist or advocate for 9-11 justice when I admitted that I don't know what happened that day or who was ultimately responsible. You know, when I, when I there was a time I used to think I knew exactly what happened, and I you know, I looked at certain information and said, oh, well, that's not right. So, you know, maybe I'm not right about this or, you know, whatever. But I honestly, I don't know what happened that day. And one of the things you mentioned earlier, or one of the questions I asked you earlier is do we, as citizens, you know, is it our job to do an investigation? And we are limited. You know, we can't subpoena people to, to come under oath we can't arrest people when they lie under oath. We can't subpoena for for certain documents. You know, we're limited. We're very limited. So, yes, we should we should look at the issue to get an understanding, you know, about why we were lied to, about what some of the lies are. But, you know, again, we're limited. And one of the things that I talked about from Michael Rupert, he said using their words against them, is a very important tool. And I spoke with Eric Larson in one of my interviews talking about, you know, looking at the documentation from the 9-11 Commission and comparing it to what's in the report. And in a lot of times, you'll see that it's different. So you, if you find documentation like that in the 9-11 Commission, it's very important because it, it contradicts, you know, it shows that they're lying. Anyway, so that's an important tool, using their words against them. Um, I want to thank you very much for your time today. Um, This was an experiment to see if we can do this without, you know, uh, attacking people and and so on and so forth. And I don't think that we did attack anybody. Uh, If we did, I apologize. You know, whatever. We may have attacked some people's belief systems. Well, you know, it, it's anyway. hard nowadays not to do that. <laughs> you know, on, on any issue because of, you know, I thought that this was a very, I thought that this was a very important topic that needed to be talked about um, because it caused so many problems for the 9/11 Truth Movement and other movements and other causes, and people need to know about what happened so that they can try to avoid it in the future um, for any issue. Um, So anyway, thanks, John, for your time today. Um, I recommend people go watch your your movie. It was Everybody's Got to Learn Sometime. It's an old movie. I don't know how how accurate everything is in it anymore. Um, I think it was pretty pretty accurate, um, if I remember Um. correctly. Well, you know, if it, if it you know, and, and again, the devil is in the details, isn't it? Yep. Um, yes, it is. I mean, that's, anyway, that's John. a challenge. And, you know, if we don't have access, you know, if, if we don't have access to facts that can be verified, which I don't know, as American citizens, you ask the question, should we be investigating? Um, the answer, sadly, is no, uh, because I don't think we have the access um, no, but we should we should definitely get an understanding, uh, you know, about what we're fighting for. We should um, do the best that we can to understand the issues, yeah. all of, all of the issues, of course. And you know, when it comes to the issues of science, that's one area that still remains uh, strong. You know, it, it's easy to have a conspiracy among politicians. It's hard to have a conspiracy that involves all the scientists in the world. Uh, science kind of stands on its own. So, you know, we do have some tools available to us, and we should use them. Well, all righty. 
thank you very much, John, for your time today. All right, and I hope I hope your family is well and, and all that stuff. All right. Good luck. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. All right. Thanks, John.